welcome back to Just One Question. And this is actually the third one question that I have asked on this series. Uh, and so I'm really excited to kick off the new question with the amazing Stacy Kopas. Uh, Stacy is, it says here, the queen of resilience. I think that's cool. I've known Stacy for almost almost a year now, isn't it? Yeah. Um, uh, she's the queen of resilience. Seven times world surfing champion Lane Beachley said so, so you know it's true. And a badass. She was called a badass by the world's toughest man, David Goggins. I want to find out who, why he's the world's toughest man. But anyway, um, Stacy's amazing. And, and when I first met her, I just uh, I wanted to get to know her and work with her because uh, um, when you first meet her, you realize she just has a tremendous amount of positive energy and enthusiasm. And she has not let a devastating accident that left her a quadriplegic and needing a wheelchair for life at age 12 slow her down. Um, although she did go through a period when she struggled a bit with that. Who wouldn't? Um, and her story is amazing. I commend all of you to her book, How to Be Resilient. She's the founder of the Academy of Resilience, and she's been featured by Financial Review, ABC Radio, international podcasts of all sorts for her insights on resilience in the workplace. If there was ever a time when we needed resilience, Stacy, it's now. And so you're just the perfect person to kick off this part three of, uh, uh, of this podcast series um, with. And who knew we would need three questions. I mean, I was really hoping one would do and we'd be done and we'd be back to work in the old way, but we're not. So anyway, here we are. Stacy. just bring us up to date quickly. How are you doing? I'm doing okay. It's, it's interesting for me. I think I'm somebody that thrives in uncertainty and an element of chaos. I'm probably more comfortable in that space than I am when everything is going as normal. I do like that element of uncertainty. I, I like variety. I like all that sort of stuff. Um, but that's not to say that it hasn't been a challenging time. And, you know, definitely in the beginning, I, I sat back and just observed for a very, for, for, for quite a long time, even though I knew that resilience was definitely a topic that was something that was of value right now. But I just sort of thought it was good to sit back and, and sort of see how I feel, felt about it. And I've definitely over the time have swung from wow, I'm so excited. I've got all this time and space to create to go in the other one and going around. I feel so overwhelmed and restless. I can't do anything. Mm. Um, but now that we're, geez, what is it? Um, four, four months, yeah. four months now into this crazy adventure that we're on. Mm. Um, then I've definitely, I really feel I've sort of found a little bit of that middle ground and um, yeah, sort of as much as I miss, I miss being out and about with people, even though here in Sydney, I'm able to do that a little bit more, but from, you know, from a, a business perspective, it's definitely going to be different. Great. Thanks. And, and uh, appreciate that update. It's good to know. Uh, so let's get to that one question. And my new question um, is, so we seem to be in this virtual working space. Uh, we're stuck with it for at least a while now um, and no immediate end in sight. And, I would really like to know, uh, f just from you on a very practical level, what is working for you virtually and what is not? What do you love about the virtual working world and what do you hate about the vir virtual working world? I think I might start with, I might do the reverse the reverse um, feedback positivity sandwich. So mm. I might start with what I've hated about it mm. and and I must say that in the very beginning, I was in the camp of completely resisting doing anything virtually. I was in the camp of like, I'm just going to sit this out. I can't do it how I can't do things how I was doing it and being a speaker. Like I had all my events cancelled and stuff like that. And pretty much 95% of the business was speaking. So it certainly um, shook things up there. Um, but I got to realise that resistance is futile. <laughs> As the time, as the time went on, that's probably my it's my first note. As soon as I said this question was pondered to me, I'm like, was just this few time. That's just reality now. Is that we really don't have any choice if we want to continue to connect and engage and um, and 
and work really mm. we really need to engage with the with the virtual space um i think what i really disliked about it in the beginning is i really felt i, I guess my expectations of what i needed to have said to deliver up a good virtual experience was simply unrealistic and possibly came from seeing other people have these amazing almost like tv broadcast type studio setups and so I realised that was never going to be possible for me to do. And so, again, I thought, oh, look, again, I'll write it down. So I get watched for the first few months. I hadn't done a lot of stuff on Zoom, but not actually delivered. I think I delivered one training session on Zoom before this all hit. So it wasn't a platform I was very comfortable with. Mm-hmm. And um, so what I did was I actually set up a virtual drop-in centre, opened my Zoom room for half an hour every day, for two reasons, I felt that was all I could be of service, even though I was really sort of sitting on the sidelines. But it was also how to get more comfortable with the platform and engaging and mm. trying to find my way of being able to try and bring my energy and the element of connection, because that was the thing I really felt that I couldn't replicate was the I'm really being on connecting energetically with an audience. So that was the thing I was really concerned about, and I just felt that I couldn't I didn't want to deliver a subpar experience was a big thing. Mm. So once I realised that there was no ones in sight, that we are in that ultra marathon, ultra marathons at the moment, um, once I realised that that was, that was happening, then I realised that I really had to, I had to just, um, I had to get on board um, rather than mm. just sit back and especially with the messaging. Mm. So I started to accept some invitations to do like 10 to 15 minute long guest speaker spots. So what I found through that, is I found that the things that did work once I got in there and um, got over that resistance is I found that I really needed to, I think getting familiar with the tech before mm-hmm. sort of letting yourself loose with an audience is really important. I think from an audience perspective, it's really frustrating if you've got, you've got um, a, an organiser that feels like they're doing it for the first time. Mm-hmm. So I think that it's, it's important it's preparation. It's no different than an in-person event. We've got to make sure we're prepared and um, just testing something out for the first time in that space. Um, I think that I've found works really well is working with smaller groups. So having it sort of more in the meeting mode other than the webinar mode. Mm-hmm. And I really loved when I was doing some of the smaller groups, particularly I, I spoke for a group, it's about 200 business women in South Africa. And I loved them just, just I opened up the Zoom screen as big as I could on my monitor. So I could see as many faces as I could. And the majority of the women had their cameras on. Mm. So that was really, really good really being able to actually get some of that real-time visual feedback that I'm so used to getting in person. So it actually feel a little bit more like a, a two-way conversation, which was, which was really mm-hmm. good. Mm-hmm. Um, I found getting the audience to do a bit more of the work has been definitely more engaging because I think you look at the way you actually consume the content it's it's easy to just switch off and think, oh, I'll watch the replay or to go and do something else. I find myself personally find that a lot of the time I'm listening but I'm doing something else at the same time. Because if I was in live, there's no way I would pull my phone out. There's no way I would get up and walk out in the middle of someone speaking. So I feel that we need to really make sure that we're getting them engaged and getting them some reason to actually stay there. So I think that on that, it's it's it, I think it's important to... to I hate to do things and say there are no replays because I think we're so used to having a replay to come back to. So I think if we can turn, if we can make it know that this is live as if it was if I'm coming to an event, mm-hmm. I think that really helps to keep people engaged and to, to get that buy-in. Just going back to some of the things that, that doesn't work, looking at, looking at the camera for an hour straight and just talking at the camera, it's because they're, they're, they're like found there audience perspective there is a sense of intimacy in 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 the online experience but much like if you are talking to someone in person if someone looks you in the eye for an hour straight without looking away it's a little bit much yeah so i think that that's something that um yeah definitely need to work on um and i think but also on the flip side of that i think what doesn't work and what i really miss in this online thing is because of the way the camera is set up and where the screen is, it's not possible to make eye contact. And that's something that I feel 
I miss the most mm. and I find is probably the, one of the biggest drawbacks from working in the virtual space. Um, the other thing we found that from a, from a participant perspective that doesn't work, I was actually on a, a large event here in Australia like online on the weekend and they just all set up with just webinar style, but they didn't have the chat feature. Mm. And I just found, you know, having someone present for half an hour to an hour with no way to engage yeah. was, was it, I felt really frustrated. There was a question there, but I want to interact with the, that's one thing I do like about the online space and virtual world is the opportunity to have that chat going yeah. with, with the other participants. And I think there's a lot of value in that. And I've actually made some really good connections and mm. connected with people then further because of a common interest in a particular topic that they've been in line with. So that's, I guess, from a, from a quick perspective and reflection mm. over the last few months, that's how I'm sort of feeling about the online space. Learning to live it, learning to love the fact that I don't have to get on a plane mm. to either speak or to actually take part in things. And I'm getting a lot of international work now, even though a lot of the time I look at the times and I because it's like 4 a.m. or 3 a.m. for me to do. But I can sleep in bed. I can get up an hour beforehand. I don't have to fly across the other side to do it. So there's lots of good things about it. And I like to overall focus. You can get what you focus on. So I really definitely want to focus on the positives. Excellent. Stacey Cobbis, everybody, thank you for that. That's uh, That may be the final answer. We may have to go to a new question just because you, I think, definitively took care of that one. So thank you very much. Uh, it's good to see you stay cool there in Australia. And uh, here's to uh, both of us getting on a plane, either me coming to Australia or you coming to the U.S. at some time in the future. That would be awesome. Absolutely look forward to it.